Before we get started, are there any questions? Barbara. Where's my bill? <laughs> Paraclete, uh, it made reference to it on page 72 and, and earlier uh, in the chapter, but... It is the Holy Spirit. Oh. Paraclete, the one who intercedes for us, is the Holy Spirit. Okay, thank you. I'm surprised it didn't give more of an explanation. Yes? On the first page of the chapter, it says that the church granted the bishops the power to forgive sin. Right. Um, and then it never said anything else about it. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that. The reason why, and that particularly was the Bishop of Rome that pushed that, because um, in after Peter's confession, Jesus said, you are Peter, which means rock. It literally means rocky. Okay, it was a nickname. Um, Petros means rock. You know, you speak Spanish, right? Same thing. Um, and when he said, you are Peter the rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This was interpreted as being the right to you know, convict people of sin, acknowledge people's sin in, in a way that's damning even, and to uh, release them from sin, to forgive their sins. Uh, we Protestants think that was reaching a little too far in terms of what was meant by that. But that was the basic interpretation that came from that. And then particularly, um, some of the bishops who had demonstrated their holiness by going through persecutions. Some of the bishops that showed up, if you get, if you get to the part of reading about the Council of Nicaea, for instance, the bishop of Egypt had only one eye, he lost one in the persecutions. Well, people like that that had suffered so much, who were bishops, were seen as being particularly holy, particularly spiritual. And so, therefore, given their spiritual nature and the interpretation of some of the passages in Scripture, like the one of Jesus speaking to Peter, they developed this idea that, that the, the leadership of the church, particularly bishops, and most particularly the Bishop of Rome, you know, that is the Pope's title. That's the, I mean, he has other titles, the, but his only official ecclesiastical title of the, of the Pope is the Bishop of Rome. And yet, because the first Bishop of Rome traditionally is understood to have been Peter, and Peter was the one that spoke, that, that Jesus spoke that to. The idea is that the Bishop of Rome was the first among equals among the bishops. And so, and it used to be true that the major uh, ecclesiastical centers, the centers of the church, were um, Jerusalem, Antioch, which is in Syria now, what we know as Syria, Alexandria in Egypt, Constantinople came in later, and Rome. Well, where are all those other cities now? In either Muslim or Jewish territory. No, they're not predominantly Christian, particularly Alexandria, Antioch, and Constantinople. And so, therefore, Rome was the only major see, the only major Christian center left. And so the bishop that was in charge of Rome ended up being the senior bishop in all Christendom because he was the only one who existed of the original major centers of the Christian faith. Okay? We'll get into that a little bit. Yes. Okay. On page uh, 87, <clears throat> it says, on the positive side, uh, what Clement and um, Origen did was preserve humanism for Christianity. And right. That threw me. Humanism. Okay. Humanism is not a bad word. Mm -hmm. There is a Christian humanism. What humanism means, really, literally, is regard for human, for human beings. Mm -hmm. And so the danger in any, in any religion, not just Christianity, has been, you've heard the expression, a person is so heavenly oriented they're no earthly good. Well, what they're saying there is by keeping a focus on the humanity and the fact that Jesus came as a person and he came for people, they kept a, the, a humanistic or a human oriented focus on Christianity so that it didn't become all ritual and all you know, theology and all, you know, this kind of stuff. But it, it was grounded in what do people really need? That's all that means. Okay. There is secular humanism, which is yes. what most people think of when they say the word humanism. Yes. But there is also Christian humanism, which means understanding the Christian faith in light of how it affects people. Okay? Thank you. Fair? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there something else over here? Other questions from your reading? I don't know why they didn't explain what paraclete means in that particular passage, but it means the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let me open with prayer and we'll get started with today. 
And Father God, we again are truly grateful for all your grace to us. We thank you that you love us, that you have saved us, and that you desire for us to grow closer to you. And we pray that through this course, as we learn how you have acted down through history, first from your son, and then the apostles that Jesus had, and then all of the actions of the church, even when we have fallen short and been blind and been stupid, you still have loved us and you still have been present. Give us wisdom to study the church and to understand your actions through history. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, today's class, week four, it's hard to believe that after today we're halfway through this course. Um, we're talking about emperors, bishops, saints, and intellectuals. Now, intellectuals I dealt with some last week, because you'll remember I talked about Origen and Clement of Alexandria and various others. I'm going to hold the intellectual part until uh, the rest of the intellectual consideration. Um, I got into the teachers of the church last week. Until next week when we talk about the councils. Because uh, next week is councils, monks, popes, and Augustine. The councils were the places where some of the early leaders of the church, the intellectual leaders of the church, like um, Athanasius and, and others, really shone. And so I'm going to reserve that because their arguments were primarily oriented around the discussions of the Council of Nicaea and some of the other early ecumenical councils of the church. Um, and so I'll deal with the intellectuals a little bit more later. I didn't change it on here, but today I do want to talk mostly about emperors, particularly leading up to and including Constantine, the, the first emperor that was on our side, um, and also a little bit about bishops, since you raised the issue of the Bishop of Rome, and we'll talk about bishops. Uh, uh, saints, where did our whole orientation towards saints come from? And it had to do with people's reaction after, after the martyrs that suffered under the persecutions of the Roman Empire. And as I say, we'll hold the intellectual uh, stuff to later. <laughs> um, next week, councils, monks, popes, and Augustine, and then schisms. You know what a schism is. It's a split. It means when the church splits. Schisms, barbarians, and Gregory the Great. Week 7, Charlemagne, cathedrals, crusades, and scholastics. And then poverty, inquisition, the Babylonian captivity, all in one hour. <laughs> and then the second hour, we will deal with the final exam. And probably on week 6, probably, um, I will have the what you need to know from Church History 1, the document for you to study for the final. And we, it's not just for the final, it's for everybody because it summarizes what I believe uh, are the most important things you need to understand in church history from the time of the apostles to immediate pre-reformation, basically 1500, the time immediately before Luther nailed those 95 theses onto the, the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. Okay, any questions? Next week, we go back to our regularly scheduled day, which means we will meet next week on Friday. We're taking it a week at a time. I'll explain it where we go from there, okay? All right, today, I want to talk about persecutions because that's the way we're going to lead into discussion of the emperors and how they affected the early church. Now, persecutions is something I talked about last week. And I went into some detail, but I only really went up to, um, in fact, I'll show this to you. I really only went up to the fourth, uh, third and fourth centuries. We talked last week about first century persecution, the Jewish persecution, the first Roman persecution, Nero, who was looking for a scapegoat to blame the burning of Rome on, even though historians now don't think he was really guilty, everybody was blaming him for it. And then Domitian, uh, who was really hung up on being called uh, a god, and so wanted to make sure everybody called him a god. Then in the second century, uh, Hadrian, Trajan, the thing we talked about last week where uh, Pliny the Younger was appointed governor of Bithynia, which is, was a province in the northern part of what we know as Turkey. And he was running into all these Christians. In fact, he got there, took his, took his job, and he showed up, and he wrote back to the emperor and said, uh, Trajan, we've got these pagan temples, and nobody's in them, and we've got these people selling animals to sacrifice to the pagan gods, and nobody's buying them. Of course, he didn't call them pagan gods. In fact, the word pagan it did not become the, the word we used for the old Roman gods until after Christianity took over, because pagan comes from the word paganus, which means rural, rural country. And it was, it was a negative word, and it was only used after Christianity became the dominant religion in all the urban centers. And it was still thought of that the only people who were worshiping the old, old gods were the people who lived out in the country, the paganus, you know, the country <coughs> people. And that's where the word pagan came from. So that even, wasn't even used until the Christian era. Okay? But we call it pagan because we know what we're talking about then. 
So uh, Trajan instructed Pliny and said, well, yes, it's technically illegal since Nero to be a Christian, but these people haven't done anything to deserve us going out looking for them, so don't do anything about it unless, unless one of them shows up, meaning somebody brings an accusation to you. And so from uh, Trajan on, it was technically illegal from that moment on to be a Christian. It had been under Nero, but Nero's persecution was mostly just Rome and surrounding. Under Trajan, anywhere in the Roman Empire that somebody accused someone else of being a Christian, they could be brought before the authorities for that. But it was not an active persecution. It tended to go in, in, in fits and spurts in terms of where and when persecution happened. Marcus Aurelius, one of the greatest of the Roman emperors in terms of his leadership and his erudition and his scholarship, he was a very learned man, um, he simply felt like um, they were, Christians were a lower class of people. He had the common opinion that they were, and many of them were slaves, but that they weren't, they didn't make any sense, they weren't learned, and so he persecuted them, almost persecuted them not so much for religious reasons as cultural reasons. But then we get down to the third and fourth century, and what I want to do is to spend a little time talking about um, the per persecutions that happened briefly again. I mentioned this earlier under uh, Septimius Severus, who still, every time I read that name, I think he should be in a Harry Potter book. Um, and then Decius, Valerian, and Diocletian, and Galerius. And I'm particularly going to, we're going to talk a little bit more about Diocletian, and that's going to take us up to. 313, the Edict of Milan, which, which brought religious freedom, at least a freedom from persecution, if nothing else, uh, under Emperor Constantine, and also Lucinius. Constantine wasn't the emperor of the whole Roman Empire when the, the Edict of Milan was written. He was co-emperor with Lucinius. We're gonna, and we're gonna explain all that co-emperor stuff. But the two of them got together in Milan and did two things. They signed an agreement to stop the persecution that had been happening, and secondly, they had a truce which didn't last too awfully long, because by 335, Constantine was emperor of the whole thing, all right? <laughs> so, um, the reason for all of this concern, I've showed you this map before, the green areas here, you see the, the green, is where there were Christian churches and Christian communities by the end of the first century. That means 100, within 70 years of Jesus' death. The brown areas, all the way up here into Germania, uh, up north into north, the areas north of um, what we know as Greece, Macedonia, and Thrace, all the way up, pretty much all of Turkey, all the way up into Russia, down here into the Arabian area, Egypt, of course, North Africa, uh, this area, Numidia, and around Carthage. Christianity had spread almost beyond the borders of the Roman Empire, beyond the borders of the known world. We're going to look at the, at the outline of the Roman Empire later. This is by the year 200 it had grown that much. Um, by the time of the last great persecution, there were probably 1,800 bishops, which meant that a bishop was either the senior pastor in a city or in some cases was a senior pastor over an area. And this was during a time when it was illegal to be a Christian. I think there's something a little miraculous in all of that. Okay? And we need to recognize that. But this is why the Christians gave the Roman emperors pause. Because even though it had been illegal all this time, and even though they were thought of as being kind of backward and not well-educated generally in a lower social class, they were everywhere. And so several of the efforts by the Roman emperors that led to persecution, it was because the, the Christians were becoming so populous. So many of them. All right? We'll talk about that. So let's talk about the persecutions under Severus, not Sneem, Severus, Decius, and Valerian. First, Emperor Sept Septimius Severus. He was 193 to 211. He had a number of problems to address when he became emperor. First, he had managed to put an end very early in his reign to a series of civil wars. This is an issue that's going to come up later when Diocletian uh, becomes emperor because in the 100 years before Diocletian, which includes this period that, that, that Severus is in, they had had 30 emperors in 100 years. Do the math. That means most emperors didn't last more than about three years. And they didn't last more than about three years because somebody was killing them, or their children were rebelling because the oldest son wanted to be the emperor, or the, the legions out in the field 
had a general that they liked so much they thought he should be emperor, and if you don't control the army, you don't control the empire. And so during that period of time, there had been a number of different civil, civil wars. Severus was successful in putting down those civil wars, but once he did that, there were other problems he had to address, particularly first, the borders. You will notice, um, when, if you look at a map of the Roman Empire, it surrounds the Mediterranean. In fact, they talk about the fact that in the first three centuries of, of the modern era, that the Mediterranean was called Rome's Lake because Rome controlled all of the area around the Mediterranean Sea. It was Rome's lake. And yet you get a little bit outside that border area that they controlled, you get up into the German areas, you know, or Gaul, parts of Gaul, you get up into Russia, you get down into the areas around Egypt, and you've got all these what were called barbarians, which meant they were, um, they, they didn't speak the language, they didn't speak Greek, they were considered uncivilized, but they had their own opinion about whether or not they wanted to put up with the Romans, because the Romans were always trying to take over more territory. So the barbarians were constantly uh, sending exposition, uh, expeditions into Roman territory to rob these wealthy Roman towns. And the Romans were always having to respond to that. And it was a constant problem. They were a constant threat. Eventually, in the, in the 400s, when Rome is sacked, the city of Rome is sacked, who does it? The barbarians. Visigoths and Goths and Huns, they kind of lined up. They took a number to see who got to sack Rome next, starting in the 400s. And so there was a reason why the barbarians were a problem for the Romans, Romans all during this time. So Severus saw that as a major threat and problem. He also had within the Roman Empire a number of dissident groups, particularly people who advocated that somebody else should be emperor, or that, that uh, there was always the threat of a civil uprising. During most of this time, the Roman Senate um, was supposed to be the authority of Rome. Technically, the Roman Senate were the, supposed to be the ones. It was by the authority of the Senate that the emperors ruled. But the emperors didn't care about the Senate because the Senate had no control over the military. And yet there were senators who were always trying to buy to get power back from the emperor. From Julius Caesar on, the emperors did not have to listen to the Senate if they didn't want to. In fact, Around this time, they stopped even living in Rome. The emperors lived elsewhere. They didn't live in Rome. And one of the reasons was because they didn't want to have to be around the Senate. And yet there was always this political stuff going on in the background. So Severus feels like he's got to address those problems. How does he do it? His solution was to unite the empire religiously. He couldn't unite it politically because there were too many other factions. But he figured if he could unite it religiously, then he would be way down the road in terms of keeping these, these things, these fires from, from flaming up in different parts of the empire. And so he decided the way to do it, allow everybody to worship however they want and whatever God they want, as long as they did it under the auspices of one supreme being, he thought, which was Sol Invictus. Sol Invictus is the unconquered sun. It has always been a major deity throughout human history. People have worshiped the sun. And it was a major theme to the Romans. Um, what's the first day of the week named? Sunday. Sunday. How do you think we got that? Because of when they worshiped the sun. What's the second day that we call? Moon day. Lunis. Because the moon was worshiped. And then you get into, into Scandinavian gods. Woden and Thor and you know all these other gods. Uh, but... Sunday and Monday, two days of the week, we still keep the names based upon the fact that the planets, or the sun and the moon, were worshipped. And we planets were as well. I mean, Jupiter was one of the Roman gods, right? Uh, is there a joke? Is there a comment? Well, he just said Saturday was taken. <laughs> That's right. Saturn day. Okay? Um, so, anyway. Um, so, Severus said, I'll get everybody to worship solid Invictus. The unconquered sun, whatever else they want to worship, that'll be first. And if I get everybody worshiping in the same direction, then I won't have as much problem with these uprisings. Well, the problem was there were two groups in the empire, one of which had become fairly, fairly numerous, even though under persecution. The Jews and the Christians absolutely refused. They absolutely refused to worship any other pagan deity or entity like Saul Invictus. And so... Because they refused, and he couldn't get them to, to, the Romans had long ago decided the Jews weren't going to do what they wanted. You know, they just put up with them. 
but now we had all these Christians, and it was growing like crazy, unlike Judaism. Judaism never grew aggressively in the Roman Empire, <coughs> mostly because they expected things that, that Romans and Greeks were not keen on doing, like we've said before, like, okay, you're a man, you want to become Jewish, you cut off part of your anatomy, and it's a part of the anatomy that most men liked. And so they were not open to converting to Judaism. Christianity comes along, and it's a monotheistic religion, which people were attracted to, but you didn't have to do all that stuff. You could still eat bacon, you could still eat lobster, you didn't have to be circumcised, and they're going, ooh, okay, the carnival's in town, I like that. And so people converted to Christianity in greater numbers, even when it was illegal. People who were looking for a monotheistic belief that they could be part of converted to Christianity. So Severus, because you have all these Jews and all these Christians who refuse to agree to this syncretistic worship of Saul Invictus above, above all, in two, 202 AD, 202 AD, he forbade anyone to convert to Judaism or Christianity. And as a result, we have persecution, not on a, an uh, empire-wide scale, but local persecutions happening particularly in urban areas, um, with a special focus on conversion, which means teachers, the people who led the catechumens, catechumens were candidates to become Christians, either the people who um, were the teachers who led people to convert, <coughs> or the people who had converted were persecuted, and persecuted pretty vigorously but still in an isolated kind of way, all because there were political reasons for this. The only reason there was a, religi a religious reason is because there was a political reason. Then we have Emperor Decius. Now, um, Ross, yeah. I have a question. Sure. Severus was Judai? No, no, Roman. Because Judas, I, I, Judas before conversion to the Judai into the... Well, that was in the first century, the first persecution ever. I, I'm, I've gone to the third and fourth centuries now, so this is 200 years later. Okay, almost 200 years later. Um, the, the, the Jewish persecution in the first century was really in the first 40, well, less than, yeah, first 40 years between Jesus' death around AD 30 and the Roman destruction of, the, of Jerusalem in, in AD 70. From about AD 66 on, the Jews had other things, you know, other problems, rather than persecuting Christians, because the Romans were about to destroy their culture, okay, or they thought they were. Um, so, no, these are all Romans. I have, we've gone two centuries ahead of that now. I talked about those persecutions earlier. This is leading up to the big change, which is Constantine. But you need to have some background here. Now, um, one of the things you need to notice here is that the persecution under Septimius Severus, was, he was a ruler from 193 to 211. There were several, several in between there, okay? Um, in fact, for the most part, they didn't persecute Christians. There were these periods of where they could breathe a little easier because there was not an active persecution on it, even though it technically was still illegal. And so you will notice from 211 to 249 when Decius comes in, there's a period of about 40 years there, a little less than 40 years where there was no active persecution to speak of. There was like one year where, where um, one of the emperors did something, but it was very localized. So, in this time, the church sort of eased up. This is a whole generation that they went now, basically, without persecution. So let's talk about Decius. When Decius takes over in 249, the Roman Empire still had very serious problems. Particularly, they still had the barbarians threatening their borders with regular incursions. The barbarians would, you know, raid towns along the edges of the Roman Empire. And there was a serious economic crisis. Rome simply wasn't making enough money to support itself. We've known governments like that. Okay? <laughs> um, and so Decius looked at this, and his solution was he believed, from a religious perspective, political and religious, that all of the empire's problems went back to the fact that they had abandoned the ancient gods. Decius looked at history and said, well, when we were worshiping the sun and Jupiter and, you know, Zeus and you know, all these others, because the Roman gods and the Greek gods were interchangeable. They just took the same gods, and, and Rome was very efficient. They took the Greek gods and changed their names and then added whatever new gods came along. Decius said, when we were great was when we were all worshiping the old gods. That's what's wrong with us. That's why we're having all these problems, is because we're not worshiping the old gods anymore. So for him, it really was a religious question, not just a political one. He was going to solve his political problem by addressing a religious concern. Um, so to restore Rome's glory, he said we have to restore the old gods, that they're what we're worshiping. 
He believed that at stake was the very survival of Rome itself, and that anybody who refused to worship the old gods, therefore, was guilty of high treason. So not worshiping the old gods of Rome made you a traitor to the empire. And so people were persecuted during the, uh, the persecution of Decius for being disloyal to the empire. Okay? Very strange kind of thing. Um, so Decius then launches what is the most systematic and widespread persecution up to that time. Because he believed the whole survival of the empire was at stake, they launched a persecution that spread through the whole, it wasn't just isolated or flaring up or just in Rome or just in you know, major cities, it was everywhere. The goal of De that Decius had was not to make martyrs. He was not trying to, to get rid of Christianity, he was trying to force people to worship the Roman gods of old because that's what would make them great again, the Roman Empire. So killing him didn't help. He wanted them to worship the right gods. Everyone, therefore, in the empire, everyone, including Christians, was required to worship the pagan gods and to burn incense before the statue of Decius, who, after all, was following in the line of being declared a god as the Roman emperor. Those who did uh, those things, worshipped the old gods and burned incense to Decius' statue, would receive a certificate, which would call, was called a libellum, attesting to their compliance, that, that, that verified that, yes, they had done what was required of them by worshiping the old gods. That libellum is a very important thing in terms of the history of how the church responded to, to this. Uh, and we have some of those extant. We have them from the th third century, uh, some examples of that. Um, so after 40 years, approximately, of not being persecuted between Severus and Decius, Decius comes down with the most aggressive, widespread, <coughs> concerted persecution the, Rome, the Christians had yet seen. And they weren't ready for it. They had gotten lots of days ago. They had gotten complacent. The new generation of Christians that had been converted, had, many of them had not been around, at least not as a Christian, in a time when they had to deal with what it meant to be threatened with persecution. And so, many Christians obeyed right away, and went out and sacrificed to the gods and then burned incense to Decius. Many of them. A lot. Previously, uh, there was a much lower percentage of people who immediately renounced their faith. But again, the church wasn't ready for this. They weren't geared up for it. Um, many other Christians made arrangements to sort of cheat. <laughs> they found people who would sell them a false libellum, the certificate saying you did what you had to do, they would purchase them. Or, in some cases, they would have a pagan friend of theirs go and burn incense for them and sign their name. It's like having somebody cheat on the final exam for you. You know, they signed in as you. So there were various ways in which some Christians cheated in order to have the official recognition they'd done what they had to do without actually doing it, without actually denying their faith. Uh, but a great many Christians, as has always been, as, as had always been the case before, did stand firm. They refused the order of the Roman authorities, and they were imprisoned and tortured. Remember, the goal here was not to create martyrs, but to create apostates. Apostate means somebody who denies the faith. Decius's desire to get everybody worshiping the Roman gods was not served by just killing somebody. He wanted them to change and worship the old gods because that would lead to the gods making them great again. And so many of the Christian leaders especially were arrested, tortured, tried to, they tried to force them to deny their faith and accept the old gods. Origen, one of the great scholars of the church, for instance, was one of the people that suffered during this persecution. In fact, he was tortured so badly, and he still refused to renounce the faith. When they released him, he was so badly injured that he died uh, not too long after that from his... In, from his the torture uh, that he experienced. Those who did hold out in the face of that persecution, like Origen and others, who did not, even when tortured, deny the faith, were honored as what was called confessors. That was the term for them. They were held very highly esteemed as being especially spiritual, especially godly. They had held out against torture and torment for the faith and did not renounce it as others had. Very few people were actually killed as martyrs because if they got them to the point where they had tortured them about as much as they could torture them and they still didn't renounce the faith, then they let them go because the goal wasn't to kill them, it was to get them to convert. 
You see the difference? Well, in almost all the previous persecutions, virtually everybody who had been arrested had either been martyred, because they, they were trying to get rid of Christianity then, they'd either been martyred or they had renounced the faith and become apostate. It was one or the other. Either they died or they, they uh, gave, gave in and worshipped the gods. This Decian persecution created a very complicated mix for the church because you had those people who had given in immediately, you had those people who fled persecution, you know, who ran for it. Um, and, and by the way, the church, for the most part, did not believe that was that was for all. For the most part, the church said that martyrdom, allowing yourself to be cat, caught and martyred, was a call from God. And if God had not called you to be a martyr, then you should run for it. Okay. In fact, martyrdom was so highly highly uh, regarded as a divine call of God and a special sign of spirituality that some people sought martyrdom. At one point in the persecutions, so many people were turning themselves in at the local Roman police station and saying, kill me, that they actually had to issue, the bishops of various churches issued statements that said, you know, you're not going to be regarded as having done the right thing. You know, if you, in fact, you could potentially be excommunicated if you present yourself for martyrdom and they don't actually kill you. You're not going to be honored as a martyr if you did it on purpose. You know, sort of murder by Roman authority, uh, <laughs> suicide by Roman authority. And yet, that's because they had this view that martyrdom was a great call of God. If you weren't called of God to be a martyr, then nobody held it against you if you didn't, if you didn't uh, stick around, you know, if you left. So, there were people who fled. There were others who falsified the libellum documents to avoid persecution or had somebody go in and, and you know, sign in for them and, and do the sacrifice who were Christians. And then there were others who had withstood the torture and survived and did not denounce the faith. And then there were others who died. So there was a whole range of different people who came out of this. Very few people were martyred. So all of a sudden the church doesn't have the problem of... Or is that person apostate or did they die defending the faith? You've got all sorts of levels of people. Okay? And the church has to figure out what to do about that. Fortunately, Decius's reign and the persecution he had were very brief. You'll notice 249 to 251. Okay? His later successor, like six years later, a, a companion of his, a friend of his, uh, Valerian, takes over as emperor and he revives the persecution briefly. But he ends up being captured in a war with the Persians, and taken, and so the persecution stopped then. And again, there was a period of time in which the, the Christian church knew peace after Decius and after the brief you know, flaming up of persecution under his friend Valeria. And that takes us down to you know, the late 250s. Now, any questions about that, I should say? We're going to come back to that issue of what does the church do with all of those different levels of people, because that was a critical issue. And one of the reasons we talk about these things is because a lot of the things that exist in the church today, especially in the Catholic Church today, are direct results of some of this stuff. Things that we look at and go, why in the world do they do it that way? What is that all about? Well, there are reasons when you study the history of the church. We'll talk about that a little bit. Okay? Questions? All right. This was what the Roman Empire looked like in the late 3rd century. Remember what I said about the... Oh, battery's dying on everything. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Remember what I said about it being a Roman lake? This is Spain and Portugal. Um, this is France and Germany, Italy. I'm using the names you know them, them by. This would be the Balkan countries, Greece. Um, this is Asia Minor, was called then. It's now Turkey. This would be Palestine, the Holy Land. This is Egypt. All of this is North Africa, like Libya, this would have been called Numidia. This is the Roman Empire. And all the way up here into Britain, Roman Britain. Okay? Got a picture there of what the Roman Empire looked like. We now come to one of the truly great, from a historical, you know, uh, leadership kind of role, not from a, what do we think of as Christians role, but, um, and that is the Emperor Diocletian. Diocletian comes along 284 to 305. Now, Diocletian is best known, as I say, he was, quite, he was a smart emperor, and he did, he, he did a lot. 
Um, but the thing he's best known for is having split the empire in two, which is very interesting because Diocletian's palace, I'm going to show you pictures in a couple minutes, is in the city of Split in Croatia. Okay? Um, he no, was originally... What's that? No, you're making up things. No, I'm not! <laughs> You've been there, Carolyn. Anybody else been to been to Croatia, the city of Split? Okay, Barbara. Okay. Okay. Well, it's a wonderful city. Uh, bluest water ever. Um, so anyway, Diocletian originally had come from Dalmatia, you know, the Balkan countries, Croatia, um, Macedonia, Albania, that area, um, and he had been the son of slaves, but had joined the army and was really good at it, and had moved up through the ranks and become a general. And almost all of the emperors at this time. Remember, you don't control the army, you don't get the emperor. Because the army was where the power was. And so almost all of these guys had been army generals who were very successful and who had a following in the army and therefore became, uh, even though he started out as the son of slaves in Dalmatia. Dalmatia is the area, it's not just, it's not called that because they have spotted dogs. It's the area along the coast there, Croatia, etc. That is where that, those dogs are supposed to come from, though. So, uh, <laughs> Emperor Diocletian. Diocletian comes along and he realizes that that Roman Empire you just looked at was way too big to be ruled by one person anymore. That one person simply could not deal with the size or the complexities. Especially if you remember or realize that the emperor, who was the head of the military, and most of them had been generals, is how they got there, they were expected to be on, you know, wherever a war broke out, or wherever there was a major problem with barbarians, or wherever, whatever. You know, the Persians were threatening in the East, and the, the Germanic and Gaulish people from, you know, in Europe. And, and yet, very simply, the emperor couldn't be everywhere. And you couldn't just hop on a plane and be there in half, half a dozen hours if, the, somebody, if a war broke out somewhere. So he decided that the empire was too large and too complex for one ruler. He also recognized that the devastation that had been caused in Rome, the, the, the civil unrest and problems that had been brought about by the succession process. Again, 30 emperors in 100 years. The idea that the son of the ruling emperor would take over when he died, well, if the son wasn't particularly powerful or particularly popular or not very old, you know, he was the first one to go after, the, after his father died. And some other general would rise up. And, all, and so Diocletian said, okay, we're killing ourselves here. This is not working. We've got to have a different way of doing this if we're going to, to be great again. Because Diocletian had the same desire as his predecessors did, and that was to regain the greatness that Roman had in the first century, which was it's the golden age uh, for Rome. So he split the empire in two, the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire. Eastern. Eastern. Oh, okay. The Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire. That's Latin. <laughs> Kidding. Sorry. Eastern and Western. <laughs> he also, Diocletian was also smart. He tried to create a more productive succession process by creating a team of four emperors. So he split the empire in two. And then in order to try to resolve this succession problem, where everybody's getting assassinated, he had two senior emperors who were called uh, Augustus. Remember Caesar Augustus? It wasn't his name. Augustus means the exalted one. So two exalted or Augustus emperors, and then two junior or Caesar emperors. With a plan that after 10 years, the Augustus emperors, the senior emperors, would voluntarily step down, step aside, retire, and the junior emperors, the Caesars, would step up to be the senior emperors, and then they would appoint two new junior emperors. So you're putting it in place that, and then the idea was, take the strongest people, make them the junior emperors, and that way they're sure that without having to kill somebody else, assassinate somebody else, or be assassinated yourself, you're eventually going to be one of the top guy, one top two guys over the whole Roman Empire. It was not a bad idea. It was actually a pretty good plan for succession. So at this first stage, Diocletian selected a military guy named uh, Maximian to be his co-emperor, and the two Caesars, you know, the junior emperors, were Galerius under Diocletian and uh, Constantius I, or uh, Constantius Chlorus, he's sometimes called, I think that's how they refer to him in our book, to be the junior emperor under Maximian. Diocletian and Galerius, C 
senior and junior emperor over the Eastern Empire, because that's where Diocletian was from, and he wanted to be close to his old home. He was looking forward to retirement. And then in the Western Empire, uh, Western Europe, you have uh, Maximian and uh, Constantius Chlorus, Constantius I, as the senior and junior emperor. And it seemed to be working. There seemed to be, once this was put in place, a new peace. Everybody wasn't trying to figure out who I got to assassinate to move up the ranks. And more prosperity. They seemed to be able to manage it better by breaking it up like that. You're, right now you're thinking this is the history of the Roman Empire, not the history of the church, right? Well, for the first 350 years, at least, there was no difference. So this is how it split up. Again, this is... Spain and Portugal, France, Germany, Italy, um, the Eastern Europe, uh, Greece, Asia Minor, or Turkey, Palestine, Egypt. This is all the stuff we looked at a minute ago. Diocletian split it right down the middle, right here. Diocletian, who lived in uh, Nicomedia, uh, or Nicomedia, near Byzantium, near Constantinople, that was his home. <coughs> Galerius, his junior emperor, was in Thessalonica. He actually moved someplace else later. The co-emperor and the guy who was over the whole Western Empire, Maximian, was located in uh, basically in northern Italy. Um, and then Trier in Germany was the home of Constantius I, or Constantius Florus. And so they ran it as two pieces, with Diocletian and Maximian being equal in terms of the senior emperors. Now we say that, but Diocletian, who put this all in place, was still what everybody kind of looked to for counsel, even though technically he was equal to Maximian. All right? Uh, another picture of it, uh, a little more colorful, is you, you know, the line again gets drawn uh, here. The blue is the area that was controlled by Maximian. This yellow, in, in terms of uh, Gaul and basically it's uh, Germania, it's Germany and France and Britain were controlled by uh, Constantius Florus. This pink area here would be where Galerius was controlling, and all of this area here, the purple, is where uh, Diocletian maintained control. You got that? Now, um, this is leading up some. Sure. <laughs> The division of the empire seemed to be working, as I said, um, and there was a new peace and prosperity, and as a result of that, there was, uh, for a long time, there seemed to be peace and uh, very little persecution. But then Galerius, who was the junior emperor, the Caesar under Diocletian, he gets a burr under his saddle about Christians in the military. A lot of Christians wouldn't join the military because uh, being a soldier meant you in almost every case, you had to sacrifice to the gods. There was a whole lot of religious stuff associated with being part of the Roman army. Well, there were a number of Christians that were, they tried to draft who refused and they executed them and then they had Christians who were in the army who wanted to leave and they wouldn't let them leave and so they executed them and you had areas where this Christians in the army was getting to be a real problem. And so Galerius finally convinces, you get the sense at this point that Diocletian is, is you know, he's short time it. He's, he's easily influenced. Galerius comes in and convinces Diocletian that he should expel all the Christians from the army. So he does, because Diocletian is the senior emperor of the, of the East. Then, Galerius' prejudice against Christians seems to be increasing, and eventually he convinces Diocletian that not only should uh, Christians be kept out of the military, but they should be kept out of all government positions, and in order to keep them under control, they should get rid of all the, local, the churches, just the buildings, and take their sacred scriptures away from them, basically the Bible. Well, that was all bad enough, but when you start taking the Bible away from Christians, even in the third century, they don't like it. So some Christians refused to turn over their scripture. Then we ended up with two very mysterious fires that occurred in the imperial palace in Split, where there was a palace that was built for him in Split. And so, Diocletian, who was a very, you know, who was a strong personality, even though he was short time in it, he finally says, okay, that's it. I think Christians did this, and therefore all Christians must sacrifice to the gods so that we know they're really on our side. And that began what's called the Great Persecution under Diocletian and Galerius. The other emperors, uh, Maximian and Constantius I, also went along with it, although Constantius 
apparently was really reluctant, and the only thing he did for show, mostly for the other emperors, was he tore down a few churches. But there was not any other more aggressive persecution. But this great persecution, especially under the areas Galerius controlled and Diocletian controlled, was the most cruel and widespread persecution that had been known yet. Even much worse even than, than Decius's persecution. And this is an artist's conception of what the imperial palace that Diocletian had built for himself in Split looked like when they first built it. Okay. Um, this is what it looks like today. It's almost a city, you know. Um, these are the major gates that come into it, and it's everything inside these walls, you know, is his palace. Um, so now there are markets in there, there's, there are churches in there from later on, uh, all kinds of stuff. And if you go there, there's these wonderful tours they have. And we were down in the bowels, what would have been the dungeons, and I found like one place where there were three crosses scratched in stone, you know. 1800 years ago, maybe. Um, fascinating stuff. So, just wanted you to see that. Somebody said they wanted more images in the classes, so uh, you, you should go to this. Now, and even if you just want to go someplace warm and beautiful where the water is the bluest water I've ever seen, good place to go. That's uh, really wonderful. Croatia. It's now what's, what we know as Croatia. Okay. So, is that the city on the Mediterranean? Yeah, right on the water. And even though Split, you know, right around, right around the corner from where that, that palace is, is one of the largest ferry terminals on, you know, on the Aegean. Uh, and it, so you've got these giant ferries there, and you think that, that the water is going to be polluted and oil floating on everything else. Right between these ferries, you look down and you can see 60 feet to the, to the bottom, you know, below. It's that's stunningly beautiful water yeah. everywhere you go. So, yeah. um, Okay, so in 305, according to the plan, both Diocletian and Maxim Maximian abdicate. They step down as senior emperors. So Galerius and Constantius I step up and become the senior emperors. Then two new Caesari, or junior emperors, get appointed. It's Severus, a different Severus, not the old one. Um, Severus and uh, Maximinus Dia. However, both of them are loyal to Galerius. Constantius I is kind of isolated by himself now. Both of the new junior emperors are supporters of Galerius. Galerius being the one who caused all the problems with persecution. He's the one who convinced Diocletian to go on. Well, when Constantius I, Constantius Florus, dies, his junior emperor should have stepped up and taken over, Severus. But Constantius I has a son who is a general in his armies. His name is Constantine. Constantine is very popular with the soldiers. And so the soldiers, when Constantius dies, rather than accepting that the junior emperor is going to take over the plan for succession that Diocletian had put in place, Constantine's soldiers go, no, we don't accept that. We think Constantine, the son of the senior emperor who just died, he should be emperor. So all of a sudden the, succession, the, the strategy for succession is not working all of a sudden. Okay? Then Maxentius, uh, or I'm sorry, Maximian, who was the senior emperor with Diocletian who stepped down, his son, Maxentius, his soldiers also didn't want him to just, you know, go quietly into that good night. And so they support him, and Maxentius and the son of uh, Maximian, the, the old senior emperor, they seize Rome. Well, that's where Severus was staying, and Severus kills himself. All right, rather than be taken over. Galerius, who's the senior emperor in the, in the East now, and having and the only one that's left that has been an emperor for a while, you know, he's, I'm sure, sure he saw himself as the senior guy now. Diocletian's still alive, but he's in retirement. Galerius decides to invade, to, to reestablish order. But when he starts to invade Maxentius' um, area, his, his territory, his troops start abandoning him and going over to the other side because they don't like Galerius. So Galerius says, whoa, this isn't working, I better go home. And so he turns around and goes back and leaves Maxentius in, in place. Galerius, oh, I just did that part. Galerius then goes to Diocletian, who was in retirement and split, and says, we got problems. Everybody respects you. Would you come back, be emperor again with me, and let's fix this. 
Diocletian's response is great. He says, no, I enjoy raising my cabbages. <laughs> so he refuses to come back as emperor. <laughs> How many people were killing everybody around him to be emperor? Diocletian says, no, I don't do that anymore. I've been there. And yet he agrees that he will come back and uh, sort of uh, moderate the negotiations to try to settle all the problems they're having. He comes back in, and what they settle on is that they appoint a new senior co-emperor along with Galerius. It's a man named Licinius. He's supposed to be the emperor now over the west. He ends up having to move east later for various reasons. The persecutions, by the way, have continued during this time, of these, after Galerius started it all, except under the Arius that had been under Constantius Chlorus and then his son Constantine. The persecutions are not carrying on. Now, later on, Eusebius, the great historian of the church, and various other writers about church history, will make a huge deal over the fact that even before he was an actual supporter of the Christian church, Constantine could never have been accused of persecuting the church. That was a big deal to them later. And they, they would say that even then, even when he didn't realize that the hand of God was on him, and he was supporting the church even subconsciously. Then Galerius gets very sick, very, very sick, very painfully sick. And he decides that maybe it's because he's offended the wrong God. <laughs> so in 311, he issues, now he's, he's one of the two senior emperors now, him and Licinius, and he's the one that's been there longer, so he's kind of the senior, even though he's supposed to be equal. He issues an edict in 311 in which he says, you know, I've always tried to do the right fit thing for the empire, and I thought I was doing the right thing by trying to suppress Christianity, but I've decided I was wrong, and I'm really sorry, and so therefore, no more persecution against the Christians. In fact, pray for me. I don't feel so good. <laughs> okay? I'm not did. making that up. I think they did pray for it. I think they did pray for it. <laughs> Five days later, he dies. Okay? Um, but he, his edict, as one of the two co-emperors of the empire, um, went out and was in effect that there was all the persecution stopped against Christians. Then, while all this is going on, Galerius is dead. The only senior emperor that exists now is Galeri is uh, Lucinius. All of this time, Constantine has been biding his time. <coughs> he's been laying back. He's been because he had responsibility for Gaul and Britain and Germania. Where do you think the worst problems were with the barbarians? Gaul and Britain and Germania. And yet, he has been successful in suppressing all that. So Constantine, much to everybody's shock, takes his army, actually only one-fourth of his army, he leaves three-fourths of his armies behind to make sure that everything stays the way he set it up. He takes one-fourth of his army across the Alps. He approaches Rome, where uh, Maxentius, the son of the old Maxentian emperor, has taken over. You know, he didn't have any official authority, but he's taken over Rome. Maxentius comes out to fight Constantine outside Rome at a place called the, the Milvian Bridge. <laughs> Maxentius has far more troops. Everybody thinks that Constantine is going to lose. The night before the battle, Constantine has a vision. And in the sky, and there's a couple of different versions of this, but the usually accepted one is that in the sky, um, Constantine sees an image of a chi rho, which are two Greek letters, chi rho. They are the first two letters of the word Christ. They had become a symbol already for the Christian church. And he hears a voice, he believes the voice of God, saying, in this symbol, conquer. He goes, cool. The next morning, before the battle, he has his soldiers paint chi robes. It looks like a P with an X through it, okay, if you ever see that. It's an ancient symbol of the church. P with an X through it. Actually, it's an X with a P through it because it's chi robe. He has them paint that on their shields and on their banners. They fight the Battle of Milvian Bridge. Maxentius actually is on the bridge during the battle. He falls off, and in all of his armor, he sinks to the bottom and drowns. Constantine wins this battle. And he attributes his victory to the Christian God. Now, he does not become a Christian at that point. He just is recognizing that there is power in this Christian God. In fact, Constantine isn't baptized until his deathbed. 
interesting bit of history there. Okay, I'm going to give you uh, just a little bit more, and then we're going to come back and talk about Constantine. Following the Battle of Milvian Bridge, when Constantine had conquered the Western Empire now, he'd taken over Rome, Lucinius had already moved east after Galerius' death because the eastern part of the empire was considered the rich part. And so Galerius, the other senior emperor, is dead. Lucinius has moved east. Um, Constantine meets with Lucinius in Milan, which had been his base of operations when he was still in Europe. They sign the Edict of Milan, which, gives, uh, which stops the persecution and gives freedom of religion, technically. You know, not freedom of religion the way we think it would just everybody, but it's just we're not going to persecute anybody anymore. Um, in all the Roman Empire, and they sign a truce that they will not fight each other. In fact, to sort of solidify the truth, Constantine gives his sister, Constance, they all had con names, Constance, to Lucinius to marry. So his sister, Constantine's sister, marries Lucinius, the other emperor. Lucinius goes east. Constantine is there. A little bit later on, but there's always a sense in which neither one of them wants to let the other one be there. They both want to rule the empire, the whole thing, back to what they had before Diocletian split it up. So in, um, along the way, in the, the nine years after uh, 313, when they signed the Edict of Milan and the Truce, there's a sense in which they're always looking for some reason to go at each other. In fact, Constantine is, there's a plot to murder him. And the guy who uh, they believe was guilty of trying to murder him was a relative of Lucinius's, and he flees into Lucinius's territory. Well, Constantine wants to go after him and tells Lucinius, you have to turn the guy over to me. Well, Lucinius won't do it. So pressure builds, and it builds, and it builds. And finally, in 322, Constantine, uh, on the pretext of following some looting barbarians, crosses over into Lucinius's territory. Oh, by the way, I should say that the rest of the European area that Lucinius controlled, because he's in the Eastern Empire, but he still controlled part of Europe. When this episode with his relative supposedly plotting to kill um, uh, Constantine, Constantine was militarily more capable, and Lucinius knew that. And so he, he gave away the rest of his European territory and just isolated himself in the Eastern part of the Empire. So Constantine slowly is still taking over area, even with Lucinius giving it to him. In 322, Constantine goes into Lucinius' territory. Lucinius responds by gathering his army, which is considerably larger than Constantine's, because he's closer home. And they meet at uh, Adrianople. There, Constantine is victorious. Lucinius runs for it, runs back to Byzantium, which had an um, ancient city, later called Constantinople, and later than that, Istanbul. So Lucinius runs back to Byz Byzantium. Constantine says, I'll let you live if you abdicate. Lucinius, I think, agrees, but then before he can even abdicate, somebody kills him. And so Constantine marches on. He ends up taking Byzantium and making it his capital, expanding it phenomenally. In fact, when he drew the lines, there's a story, it may have been in your book, it's in one of the books I've read, um, that when Constantine decided, because Byzantium was right on the Bosphorus, which is the body of water that connects the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, it was a huge trade route. It connects, it's the place where Europe and Asia connect. If you go to you know, Constantinople now, you can see that. It's an astonishing location, and it was a perfect place for a fortified city for the center of an empire. It's right in the mid, pretty much right in the middle of what was the Roman Empire. And so Constantine goes there, and he goes out. It's a fairly small place at that point. He walks out miles from anything, and all of these people are walking behind him. This is after he's become the full emperor. And, and they say, um, where are you going? And he said, I'm following the one that leads me. Of course, all the Christians at that point, since he made Christianity okay to be, they all, all the, because there were pagan priests and Christian ministers with it, they all thought that he was talking about their God. Well, he drew a line, which everybody said, you just increased the size of this city by, like, 30-fold. How are we ever going to fill this? Well, they went to cities all over the Roman Empire and took statues and marble and took down buildings and took them there and, you know, paid people to come and live there. In fact, one historian said that the whole Roman Empire was made naked in order to clothe Constantinople. <laughs> and so they built the city. Well, within three, you know, the third emperor after that, they didn't have enough room within the walls that have been built from Constantine's directions. So 
325, Constantine is sole ruler of the Roman Empire. Under Constantine, all persecution has ended, and it became legal to be a Christian for the first time in almost 300 years, virtually since Nero, 64 AD, Nero started the persecution. We're now at 325, almost 300 years later, and it's the first time that Christians know that they're not going to be bothered. And in fact, some of the Christians did not respond very well. They started looting pagan temples. They started trying to do to the pagans what some of the pagans had done to them. Um, like Decius and Diocletian before him, Constantine is focused and determined to make the Roman Empire great again, but unlike them, he thinks the best way to do it is with Christianity as its unifying basis. That was the difference. Okay, we're going to take a break, come back and talk a little bit more about Constantine and what happens. Well, there, I, I sort of suggested a couple reasons earlier, and that is um, the Senate in Rome, technically, by the laws of Rome, was supposed to be the source of the emperor's power. The emperor was supposed to serve at the pleasure of the, the people and Senate of Rome. In fact, there's an expression about that. Uh, if you ever go to Rome, they've got these signs that say S S P Q R. Well, in Latin, that means by the by the people in, in Senate of Rome. I don't know exactly. I don't remember exactly what it means. But basically, that whole idea that the emperor originally, again, before before Julius Caesar, the emperors were elected by. It was a republic, and they voted. And it was only when Caesar was successful in making them, you know, of conquering the barbarians and doing all this stuff that they announced that he, you know, you're now not just the president, sort of. You now have freedom to rule everything, you know, because you've got executive powers have increased. Well, various emperors decided early on, after uh, Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus, Tiberius, others, decided this is pretty cool, that we don't have to ask anybody permission to do anything, and we don't have to get reelected. And so the emperors from that point on, because they were, they were generals and they controlled the army, they didn't have to ask. Even when the Senate didn't like it anymore, that, the, that they no longer control the emperors, um, the emperors controlled the military, and so they did what they wanted. But there was always a sense in which the Senate was kind of a thorn in the side of the, the emperors. They were always, there was always some political intrigue, particularly when you get to, to Constantine and you get to the idea that, and I'll mention that in a minute, uh, when he is being inclined to support, even though he's not himself a Christian yet, early on he's inclined to support the Christian faith, well, the Senate was one of the groups that, that really re rebelled against that because they were all pagan worshippers. Um, in fact, the emperor was supposed to be the head priest of the pagan pantheon. And here, and technically, he still kept that title, by the way. Constantine still, and there were times when he officiated over pagan ceremonies. No, he felt like the Christian God was the one he wanted to mostly be on the team of. Um, and so it's, it, it, the Senate was not a help to the, to the empire and, or to the emperor, excuse me, and often were a cause of problems for them. So they just wanted to stay away from them. And they tended to either be out where their, where their armies were, because that's where their power base was, or frequently, as in the case of, case of Diocletian, he originally had come from a part of the world far away from Rome, and he liked it better. And so he wanted to hang around there as much as he could. Um, it, it's also true, and this is, this is one of the least understood historical points for Westerners. If I ask you, when did the Roman Empire fall? What would you say? Can you give me a... When did the Roman Empire fall? 472. 472. What if I told you it was 1492? That's the Constitution. Well, the Roman Empire continued. The city of Rome fell in the 400s. The Western Roman Empire, remember it got split in two? The Western Roman Empire fell in the 400s. The Roman Empire continued with Constantinople, Byzantium, which, you know, Constantinople, it was Byzantium, Constantinople. It continued to be the center of the Roman Empire until the 15th century. Wow. And we don't even know that anymore. We hear the, if you hear the expression, you know, the Byzantine Empire, most people don't have a clue what that even means. The Byzantine Empire was the Roman Empire that continued in the East until it was finally defeated by the Ottoman Empire. And so Rome, in terms of the Roman Empire, not the city, the Roman Empire did not fall 
all until 1492, the same year that Columbus discovered America. But most, most people don't have a clue about that. Well, the reason why it didn't fall in the 400s, why the Roman Empire continued for a thousand years after that, is because the emperor wasn't living in Rome. He was living in Constantinople. And that became the center of the whole... And I've even taught in classes talking about history. There's a wonderful book called How the Irish Saved Civilization by, help me, Carolyn. Oh, gosh. Uh, Thomas... Cahill. Cahill. Thomas Cahill. He's written a number of wonderful books. Um, the, uh, the Gift of the Jews, which is about Jesus, uh, Sailing the Wine Red Sea, which is about the Greeks. Wonderful writer. Um, he wrote How the Irish Saved Civilization. And the whole thing is about how when Rome fell in the 400s and the Dark Ages hit Western Europe, and they really were Dark Ages, the lights went out. People forgot how to read. Cities were no longer, because if you stayed in a city, then the bar barbarians, you became a target. So you lived out in the country, and you didn't have any of the benefits of living in a city anymore. Well, the one place that, that people continued to read and continued to have books and continued to, to develop their intellects was in Ireland, because it was so far away that the barbarians never got there. They got to Britain, you know, to, to, to England and Scotland. They were in Scotland. I mean, the, you know, some of the barbarians were Scottish. <laughs> but um, may still be today. I don't know. <laughs> That's why Hadrian built a wall up there. Yeah. But in Ireland, the monasteries in Ireland, when that, once Ireland was converted, maintained learning and maintained books. Irish missionaries came back to Western Europe. They were responsible quite often for the conversion of barbarian tribes to Christianity. And reading and education and libraries and cities all kind of were revived in Western Europe because of the Irish. God, God bless them. <laughs> all right? Now, that's true in Western Europe, but the idea that civilization, the lights went out, the Irish saved all the civilization, completely discounts the fact that Constantinople and the eastern part of the empire continued to be the most civilized that the Roman Empire had ever been. There was more culture and more wealth and more uh, education and more art, you know, the Byzantine art, in, in Constantinople than there had ever been even in the earlier parts of Western Roman Empire. And we, and for years, and I consider myself something of a history buff, I was completely oblivious to that. So if you come on the cruise in October, I'm going to be talking about that, is one of the things about the, the, the fact that Asia Minor, what we know of as Turkey, has been the home of empires. The Byzantine Empire, which we completely disregard, the, the Ottoman Empire, you know, the first Muslim Empire, um, that, that part of the world that we completely don't even think about. You know, we think about Europe, we think about North America. That's a part of the world that was so rich and has been so responsible for so much in world history, and we don't have a clue. Um, shame on us. Okay, so those are some of the reasons I don't think that they, they stayed in Rome. Besides, Rome in those days was not the nicest place to be. I mean, there were there were some nice parts of Rome, but for the most part, it was very crowded. I've said before, two thirds of the people who lived there were slaves. Um, it was you were there was a lot of death. There was a lot of poverty. There was a lot of dirt. There were wealthy palaces too, but it, it wasn't um, you know it wasn't the nicest place to be. You know, Constantine was from Trier in Germany, which was a beautiful city, and you know uh, Diocletian in Split and various other places. So they had the right to be wherever they wanted. You know, they could telecommute. Um, <laughs> okay, um, I mentioned the fact that at Milvian Bridge, Constantine had defeated um, his, his primary uh, opponent, Maxentius. And then over a period of a number of years, he ended up conquering the Eastern Empire. So that by 325, he was the sole ruler over the whole of the Roman Empire. Now, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that Constantine was a Christian at this point, or that Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the empire. As I said a minute ago, Constantine officially maintained, as the, as the emperor of the Roman Empire, he officially maintained the, the title as the high priest of the Roman pantheon. He, from time to time, not often, but from time to time, would still officiate over pagan uh, rites as the high priest of the pantheon. He um, believed that Christianity, and a good way to understand that is he believed that the Christian God 
was the most powerful of the gods. And so that was his number one god. In that way, he was, um, and, you know, we've talked about this before in, in Old Testament, he was a, a henotheist. A henotheist is someone who believes that there are multiple gods, but he chooses, he or she chooses one as being the god they're going to focus on. Well, Constantine could probably be described as a henotheist because he focused on the Christian God. He thought the Christian God had proven his power and allowed him to conquer the whole empire, but he wasn't going to completely discard those others. And part of that was political practicality. There were still huge parts of the empire, and a lot of people within the Roman Empire, like the Senate, for instance, even though he didn't want to suck up to them or anything, that still advocated the old gods. And so he didn't want to completely disallow any of that. Um, Constantine... It's a weird kind of relationship because he was not baptized until his deathbed. Because he was not baptized, he was not technically a Christian, by anybody's estimation. And yet he had a whole plethora of bishops and, and Christian religious counselors and you know, people who were in senior positions in the empire who were Christians. And they knew that Constantine did stuff that a Christian shouldn't do. But they really couldn't criticize him too much because he wasn't technically a Christian. He hadn't been baptized. And yet, he was doing all the things they really wanted the emperor to do, giving them the freedom. He, in fact, one of the strange things that uh, I don't think we, we uh, again, historical phenomenon, you ever wonder where it is, if you come from elsewhere in North America, particularly, um, and it's, it's somewhat true here, but where did the idea that Churches don't have to pay taxes. That um, there's military, there's a relief from military service for somebody who is involved in a religious avocation. Okay, you can get a religious even if the draft is on. You can get um, a dispensation, a deferment, if you are in a religious profession. Where do you think all those ideas came from, Constantine? Now, it had been true that some of the pagan priests had been given special benefits before. But when Constantine came on board, churches, he built churches, he paid for them. In fact, his mother, uh, Constantine's mother, St. Helena, went to the Holy Land, and she found all of these relics. She found the one true cross, supposedly. <laughs> Supposedly, as they say. Um, and so she, she had all of these relics. She identified all these locations. She had her son build a, the church at the, the Tomb of the Holy Sepulchre, the Church of the Nativity in, in Bethlehem. All of those things were built by Constantine and his mother. As his mother went to the Holy Land, she became a Christian. She found all these things. So big emphasis on that. <coughs> Excuse me. But the idea of churches not having to pay taxes, of being of ministers being free from military service, and from paying personal taxes as well, the fact that people could give property to a church, like you could die and leave your, you know, your estate, Constantine is the one who created all of that. And that was the kind of favor that he was showing. Now think what it must have been like to be a bishop. Many of these bishops had, had been tortured for their faith. And now, here's this emperor over the whole Roman Empire who's saying, I like you Christians. I like your God. Let me, what can I do for you? All right? And they're going, yes! Okay, finally. They thought this was the hand of God. They thought Constantine was the instrument of God, even though he technically was not himself a Christian, not having been baptized until his deathbed. And um, he... He still did some kind of pagan stuff sometimes. Still, the church thought, this is, this is God's work. This is what we've been waiting for all of this time. And it was critically important for the Christian church to be supportive of Constantine and what he was doing. All right? Now, um, again, one of the reasons he stayed out of Rome is because all he got from Rome, the Roman Senate especially, was, you know, you're supposed to be advocating the pagan gods. That they're old Roman gods. Pagan, that word came later. Um, and he refused. So when he went to Byzantium, he renamed it Constantinople, the city of Constantine. He greatly enlarged the walls, you know, many, many, many times what it had been. He declared that it was the new Rome, that it was now the new eternal city and was going to be the center of the empire. And he turned it into that. Okay? Uh, and it became a, a 
Christian city to a very great extent. Now, um, it's interesting to note that not all of the people who came, all, not all the emperors who came after Constantine were Christian. Some of them were like moderately Christian. There were a couple. Uh, Theodosius is the one who declared that Christianity was the official religion of the empire. We'll talk about him a little bit later. But then uh, Constantine's nephew, Julian, who came on several emperors after him, was a, was a pagan. And he's called Julian the Apostate. He didn't persecute Christians, but he tried to remove some of the favor that they were receiving. It got reversed after him. They came back. But um, he wanted people to go back to the old gods. And he didn't like Christianity. You know, he referred to Jesus as the pale Galilean. Yeah. Because he, you know, he wasn't <clears throat> beefy, you know, like the Roman gods were supposed to be. And so there was very, very much a sense in which Constantine, while he made it legal to be a Christian, did not make Christianity the faith of the empire. It was not the official faith. Paganism technically still was the old gods. But he made it legal. Now, some people have, have accused Constantine of just being an opportunist. Meaning, okay, he only went along, along with this Christian thing because it gave him what he wanted. In fact, it, I can't imagine how many times I mentioned this book. If you've read The Da Vinci Code, <laughs> that's what Dan Brown says. He says that Constantine had political motivations. The only reason he sided with Christianity was because it got him what he wanted. <laughs> When Constantine started siding with Christianity, that's the last thing in the world anybody would have done if they were being a political opportunist. Christianity was the bottom of the totem pole when Constantine first signed on with them. Um, it, it was illegal to be a Christian. Nobody liked the Christians. Becoming a Christian would be a horrible idea if your goal was to try to gain prestige or power or influence or anything else. It was only after Constantine that Christianity, after he had done all those things that supposedly Dan Brown and others say he did for political reasons, only after he had done them, quite a bit after, did it become evident that Christianity was you know, the, the, the power center. Next week I'm going to talk about the backlash, what the negative side of having become the favor, not, not technically legally the religion of the empire, but to become the favored religion by the emperor. It had horrendously negative consequences. The growth of the church was almost stymied when they became legal and became favored by the emperor compared to what had happened before. <coughs> by the Council of Nicaea in 326, there were, I think I said this earlier, there were 1,800 bishops around the Roman Empire at a time when it was illegal to even be a Christian, much less to be a bishop, one of the people who were leader in the church. Well, that sort of thing kind of... There were other ways in which the church manifested itself. We'll talk next week about the mon monastic movement. But I think it's absolutely wrong. If Constantine was an opportunist in, uh, in taking on Christianity as his favored religion, not the only one, but as his favored religion, the only possible explanation for that was that he believed that the Christian God was more powerful. But being a Christian or favoring Christians or favoring the Christian church, in no way would that have been something that somebody as savvy as Constantine would have done if his goal was to try to get some political power or influence out of it. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot more time. I mean, I, I, next week we will get into some of the responses back from that. And next week we're going to talk about the councils of the church. The first great council of the church, the Council of Nicaea, which met in a city in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, which was, and that's where his headquarters were. You know, Constantinople was technically at that point on the Europe side of the Bosporus, but that was his, his close to his realm of influence. He called, Constantine called the first great council of the church, Nicaea, to deal with a problem that had occurred at that time. Um, they, they, we talked about it a little bit before. Um, we'll get into that some more next week. I want to talk about two other issues in the next time we have together. And the first one is, I said we we're going to talk about bishops. I want to talk about the organization of the early church. Um, by the early 2nd century, now we're into the early 4th century when we talk about Constantine, so I'm stepping back a little bit. 
the history, when you talk about so many different pieces, it doesn't go on a straight line. You know, you have to sort of keep doubling back to things that you, you couldn't mention if you were uh, making things connect earlier. By the early second century, the church had three distinct positions of authority within it. There were bishops, there were presbyters, or elders. The Greek word for elder is presbyteros. That's why a presbyter is the same thing as an elder, and there were deacons. Our church is Lakeside Presbyterian Church, which means it is, it is led by presbyters, elders. We have a board of elders, which is called a session when they're gathered together, um, and the board of elders is the authority structure for our church. We don't have a bishop. The, the churches that have elders are called Presbyterian-style churches. Churches that have bishops are called Episcopal churches. I don't mean like American Episcopal. The Catholic Church is an Episcopal church. The Methodist Church is an Episcopal church. That means they have a bishop as the head of their structure. Okay? Um, but, and, and is anybody here farsighted? Anybody here farsighted? You know, you play the trombone when you try to read something? <laughs> The name for that, farsightedness, is presbyopia. Presbyopia. It means you have old eyes. Because that's something that happens as you get older. Your eyes aren't as, aren't as flexible, and you can't focus as easily. And so you're doing this, okay? Presbyopia, elder eyes. Just, you've learned at least one thing. Okay, now, for a considerable time in the church, the title bishop and elder appeared to have been interchangeable. In fact, um, in, like in Timothy and in other places, in Titus, where they talk about elders of the church, the word bishop and elder are interchangeable. And it appears as though that early on there was no difference in them. But as time went along, and particularly as there was persecution, particularly as there were challenges to be met that required strong leadership in places, bishops became senior pastors over the other pastors in churches in the city or sometimes in a whole area. For instance, the Bishop of Carthage, which is a city in North Africa, uh, de facto, whoever was elected the Bishop of Carthage was considered the spiritual leader of all of the churches in that part of North Africa. Because the early bishops of Carthage had been, as I say here, uh, elders that were recognized as having uh, greater spiritual maturity and or greater learning that would help lead the church, especially when persecuted. Quite often, bishops were elders who had come through persecution, had not denied the faith, had maintained the faith, and so therefore were seen as examples, not just to other Christians, but to other Christian leaders. And so they were lifted up and given more recognition, they were revered more, and so therefore took on more authority. So the, the idea was originally there were just elders, and yet, even in New Testament times, we begin to see that certain ones of those elders were, were kind of put in charge. James the Just, the half-brother of Jesus, was the leader of the uh, Council of Jerusalem. Now, the Council of Jerusalem was made up of apostles and elders. So James the Just, who also was identified as an apostle, people think that there were only 12 or 13. There actually were several others, including one woman, by the way, Junia, is, identi is identified in Scripture as an apostle. Um, the idea of... James the Just being the head of the Jerusalem Council, he in effect became kind of the bishop, meaning the senior elder, or the pastor of pastors. That's where the whole concept of bishop came from. And especially during times of persecution, especially during times of heresy, when they needed somebody who really had the know-how and the spiritual ability and the ability to communicate, to stand up and be the representative who addressed, you know, who would debate with Marcion, with Marcion heresy, or debate with Valentinus, who was a Gnostic heretic. Somebody who had their chops to be able to get up and deal with those folks, that had to be somebody who was recognized as not just an everyday pastor. They had to be somebody who got it especially anointed. Those people started being recognized as senior elders or senior pastors, which they called bishops. Okay, so there was a very practical uh, reason for that. We, we are not an Episcopal body, we are a Presbyterian body, because we, you know, we, and, and as a minister in the Presbyterian Church, my title is an elder. I am an elder of the Word and Sacrament. Lay elders that are elected are, uh, are called uh, lay elders, okay? They, they, so there's a difference in terms, but we are all elders together. We all are equal when we gather together as a session. 
Okay, yes. Where did the name Lay come from? Um, I, I, I have to look up what the what the source of that is, but it's a, as opposed it means as opposed to ordained. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Probably Hawaiian. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll have to look that up. So, there was an emphasis on the authority of bishops and on apostolic succession. We talked about that before, especially in response to the challenges of heresies that came in the second and third centuries. Remember, when you get these heresies that come along and people have these wild ideas, they're going off in crazy Gnostic directions and mixing in uh, Greek mythology and mixing in Zoroastrian mythology and all this kind of stuff. One of the ways in which the church tried to address that is by saying, okay, we need, the apostles had it right. The apostles were chosen by Jesus. They were taught by Jesus. They wrote the, the, the scripture, the New Testament, or else they, you know, the people who were close to them, like John Mark for Peter, wrote the New Testament. So they're our source of authority. So if they taught somebody, and that person taught somebody, and that person taught somebody, and that person taught somebody, then probably they have it pretty right. And so apostolic succession was not some formal ritual. It actually was a very practical way to try to make sure that whoever it was that was in charge and supposed to be teaching had gotten their instructions from the people who really knew what they were talking about, which were the apostles. Okay. Some churches still today claim apostolic succession, that everyone is ordained, who is ordained is ordained by somebody who is ordained by somebody that follows that line all the way back to the apostles. Well, I know people who are ministers in the apostolic succession who would deny the divinity of Jesus before you met them, you know? I mean, that, that, that doesn't carry any weight anymore because it simply didn't work. We're 2,000 years away from the, from the apostles, and people can claim they were ordained by somebody and yet be as liberal as you want, that who was in apostolic succession, and yet be as liberal as they want. When you were only three or four or five or six or seven generations away from the apostles, then that made a lot more sense. 2,000 years later, it doesn't. And so now the standard is, are we true to the writings of the apostles? Are we true to the message of the apostles in Scripture? That's the, that's the standard, not did the person who lay your hands, lay hands on you to ordain you, you know, follow all the way back to the apostles? Because it simply doesn't work anymore. Okay? But then it did. Yes, it did. This idea of... Apostolic succession. How, I'm not sure how to word my question, but I'm wondering of the historical accuracy of that. How how can they prove that? And like you said, they're not even you know some of them are not even accurate in their beliefs. Can you you mean how to, how can they prove it today? Yeah, are there historical documents? That, yeah, well, that you you mean today? Uh, yeah. Sure? Um, well, like you mentioned last week, that someone asked you. Well, if you're not ordained with apostolic succession, how can you deliver the sacraments? And so, and my question saying, is, is, how do you know yeah. if someone is, and how do they really know? Yeah, in fact, uh, the thing they were saying to me is, I don't think it's legitimate if you don't have sacraments. That's really what they were saying. Uh, the, the question is, we, we rely on the fact that the churches they are part of claim that, they, that everybody has always been, everybody in their history has always been ordained by somebody who was ordained within that body, and that body has always practiced apostolic succession. So there's a lot of faith involved in that. You know, people in the Episcopal Church, and the Episcopal Church, uh, Anglican Church, claims apostolic succession. We just trust that, that nobody lost the record sometime, you know, or that, that, that the fox didn't creep into the hen house of the Christian Church, you know, claim, oh yeah, I was ordained in blah blah, and so... Let me, you know, let me do this. We have no way of knowing that. But the churches that, that are serious about that, they would claim that, that their church for 2,000 years has always been, you know, when the Catholic Church split off, the people who started their Protestant denomination had been ordained as Catholic priests, and so therefore apostolic succession continued in the Protestant churches. There's no way to verify that. We do know where it came from. I mean, uh, Cyprian... Um, in Carthage and you know some of the other of the early church teachers were the ones that really established that apostolic succession was one way not the only way but one way that we could be sure uh, about the, the credentials the orthodox credentials of somebody before we took them into leadership of the church and are there people in all mainline denominations that claim this or is this just Catholic Episcopal and what was it you said well um, Methodist uh, is, is an Episcopal body, but I don't think Methodists necessarily carry apostolic succession. 
Um, no, I, there's not. I mean, a lot of mainline denominations don't. Certainly Baptist ministers don't, or Pentecostal ministers. Um, most Presbyterians, I don't think. They may say, well, it's I was ordained by somebody who was ordained by somebody who was ordained by somebody, but they wouldn't claim that they would guarantee that, nor would they claim that that either does or doesn't give them credibility. Next week, we're going to talk about um, the issue, you know, like me offering the sacraments. One of the schisms of the church, Cyprian was involved in this, and it later turned into a much more serious schism, the, the Donatist, D-O-N-A-T-I-S-T, schism, and one of the major questions, one of the reasons why, for the split in the church was the question of, are the sacraments valid if they are offered by someone who is not part of the church? You know, if there is a break in the apostolic succession, if there is somebody who maybe was an apostate, um, or somebody who somebody who baptized you, and then two weeks later they declared that the whole time they've been thinking about it, they've decided Jesus wasn't really the Son of God. Well, are you a member of the church? You were baptized by somebody who then declared they didn't believe. So is it the belief of the person? Is it the spiritual quality of the person offering the sacraments? Or is it the person receiving the sacraments in faith? Which one makes it valid? That was a major controversy in the church that led to more than one split. Okay, um, And it goes back to that issue of some people, that's the, that's the reason why they advocate apostolic succession, is because if you don't know that you, you were from somebody who was from somebody who was from somebody, then you're not valid. If you're not valid, you can't offer the sacraments. That's the Donatist heresy. <coughs> I should tell my Anglican friends that they're heretics. But in that regard, the church called them a heretic. You know, if you believe that somebody is not, el it cannot legitimately offer the sacraments unless you got some credit, that the person offering is some credentials, then the sacrament is not valid. That's the Donatist schism, the dominatist heresy. We'll talk about that. Okay? Thank you. All this stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, but there's a reason why there was an emphasis both on the authority of the bishop and apostolic succession. It helped them understand uh, it was at least one way they could address not the heresies, Gnostic heresy, Marcionism, etc. that came out at that time in the late 2nd and 3rd century. And then that carried on. And part of it, I think, the apostolic succession, it had a reason, and it made sense, and it could be followed up on in the 2nd and 3rd century. In the early 21st century, not so much. We are so far away from it, we should look, <coughs> do people agree with the apostolic uh, testimony of Scripture, not who laid hands on who for 2,000 years. All right? That's what I think. <laughs> By the end of the second century, church official leadership um, was entirely masculine. By the end of the second century, we know that. Though there are indications that prior to the second century, there were women who had been involved in leadership. And again, there are scriptural indications of this. Um, you know, the four daughters of Philip were prophetesses, which meant they preached. Doesn't mean they gave, you know, they gave miraculous predictive statements. To, to prophesy is to speak the word of the Lord. So that meant they were preachers. Junia is identified as having been an apostle. You know, um, Paul re regards women as co-workers in the ministry. Equal in the ministry. Um, Priscilla and Aquila taught Apollo. And it doesn't say, in fact, Priscilla is usually listed first, which the order of things made a difference most of the time in Scripture and in that time. Priscilla appears to have been the more significant one theologically and spiritually. Uh, there is white belief, and I'm pretty much there, that Priscilla may have been the one who wrote the book of Hebrews. I can't prove that, but it answers some, some questions, like why don't we know who wrote it? It's always been accepted as being, uh, well, not always been accepted. It has, through most of the history of the church, has been accepted as part of scripture. The only reason that ever really was seriously questioned was because they didn't know who wrote it. Well, there might be a reason we don't know who wrote it, because if we knew who wrote it, people would not have accepted it. <laughs> the cause of who wrote it, even though she was a person of God. Okay? So the church had had leadership. It's believed that one of the reasons by the end of the second century there were no women in um, leadership in the church is in reaction against some of the heresies that both the cults, the pagan cults and the heresies. A lot of the pagan cults had women priestesses. <coughs> In fact, some of the things that Paul talks about in his letters to churches, uh, Corinth and elsewhere, about women being calm in church, it doesn't say be silent. It says be calm. Silent is a bad translation. Um, and for I don't want to have women to have authority over men, things like that, the suggestion, I believe, that's 
very valid is that Paul is talking about specific cases. There were women who had been priestesses in the pagan cults. Corinth was, was you know, you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting a priestess of a pagan cult in, in Corinth because it was the center of pagan worship and most of, much of it having to do with, with temple prostitutes and all that kind of stuff. Well, apparently some of those people were coming into the church and saying, well, I was in charge over there. I want to be in charge here and causing problems. And Paul is addressing that. Because this is the same Paul who makes, when he's talking about specific problems in churches, he, he talks about women being quiet. When he's talking about more universal statements about the, the church, he says things like, there is no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. But we are all one in the Lord. Okay? The universal statements that he makes are all about complete equality in Christ, including between male and female. When he's talking to specific churches where there seem to have been problems, he talks that he's addressing specific problems. So some of this pagan cult sort of thing was the problem. Even more so, women were considered completely equal in Gnosticism. A lot of the teachers of Gnosticism in the first and second centuries, um, especially the second century, were women. And so there's this sense in which they were fighting against these women who tend to be more clever than men. I'm sorry to tell you guys that that when they get involved in arguments of that sort, they were, they were strong advocates for it. And so there was a sense in which the church was rebelling against that. There was also things like the Montanist heresy, which we talked about last week, which were um, the Montanist heresy, the founder had two assistants, um, Maximilla and Priscilla, who prophesied, and they started claiming, all three of them, that their prophecies, their gift of the Spirit, the revelation the Spirit was giving them, superseded everything, including Jesus. And that they were bringing in the new era, not Jesus. And so it was declared a heresy. Well, women were at the very lead of that. And so the suggestion is that while women may have been in positions of leadership, New Testament and first, the rest of the first century, by the end of the second century, Again, in reaction against some of the problems that they were having with women, probably being smarter than a lot of the men who were trying to defend the faith, they said women shouldn't be in leadership. Um, and that became a hallmark of, of patristic theology, the early church fathers. Origen, at one point, even officially conceded that women have a soul and can be saved. Okay. Uh, don't, uh, it's not me that said that. Okay. You don't believe that, eh? Uh, so, that, that gives you an idea where the whole bishop thing came from, and the leadership in the early church and how it developed. Originally, there were elders, there were deacons, elders, some of them became bishops, and the word was synonymous, and then they were elevated because they needed them to be. They needed somebody to take strong leadership over a church, over a town, over an area, okay? A lot of church history here, the reason I'm doing this is to give you a sense of how did we get here? You know, how did some of this stuff come along? Yes, get oh, I just want to make a point on origin. I just read a book where he had said that he had, said that he had, had himself made a eunuch oh. in trying to uh, be more godly. So you can also see his... Yeah, he had some bias, he had some weirdness. <laughs> yes. In fact, there's another thing is... Um, Origen is probably the most prominent of, it wasn't just him, there were others. Mm -hmm. When Jesus said some men are born eunuchs, some, uh, you know, some are made eunuchs, some choose to become eunuchs in the kingdom of God. Origen took that seriously and castrated himself um, in order to fulfill that, what he thought was the ultimate commitment of his, and to keep himself from being tempted, supposedly. Well, if Origen was going to do it, then <clears throat> some of the lesser people thought that was a good idea, and I'm not... Talking, we're not talking thousands, but it was common enough that in addition to some of the bishops of that day saying, if you volunteer too quickly for martyrdom, then we're not going to like it, it's not okay, um, they also said anybody who's castrated themselves, uh, anybody who's a minister or a bishop who castrates themselves will be defrocked, and anybody who's castrated themselves and then apply for ministry will not be allowed into the ministry. So it was enough of a problem, they had to have a policy about it. Okay. <laughs> the question of the lapsed. I, I mentioned this earlier, and this is going to be our last topic for today. The persecution of Decius and Valerian caused many Christians to renounce their faith and worship uh, pagan gods. Again, the church wasn't ready for it when the Decian uh, persecution came. It had a generation or more without persecution, and it hit them by surprise, and they didn't, they didn't respond as well as they had previously. 
after the Decian um, and Valerian persecutions, the church was confronted with what to do with the last Christians who now wanted to return to the faith. Remember, Decius's goal was not to destroy Christianity, it was to convert people to worshiping the old Roman gods again, to make them apostates from the Christian faith. To deny that faith, worship the gods, because killing people didn't accomplish the goal. The goal was to have more people worshiping the old gods, because Decius thought that would make them great again, make Rome great again. So, the problem that they faced after these um, persecutions was that not everyone had fallen away in the same way. Previously, either people got killed as martyrs, or they, you know, or they, they denied the faith, and there was not anything in between. Here we had, the church had to deal with people who either quickly had said yes, and had conceded to the imperial demands and worshipped other gods, or they had fled in face of persecution, or they had purchased false libellum, but they had not actually committed apostasy. They lied about it to the authorities, but they hadn't actually denied Christ. Or they got a friend, to, you know, a pagan friend to do it for them, or, you know, uh, whatever. And then there were some who had only lapsed after they had been viciously tortured. So the church looks at all of these and they go, this is not all the same case. It's not either black or white anymore like it used to be when they were either martyrs or they were apostates. Is it as bad for someone to have falsified a libellum but not committed apostasy as to immediately run off and worship out the gods when they got asked? And how do you evaluate that compared to people who suffer horrible torture and still didn't deny the faith? The church struggled with how to deal with that. You know, it's, not, it's, it's a complicated issue. And people were on very different sides of it. There were some people who said, Jesus accepted Peter back after Peter had denied him, and so if somebody confesses the faith, and uh, they should be allowed back in. There were others who said, absolutely not. When we've got people who have suffered martyrdom and torture and everything else and still didn't deny, then people who, who denied the faith should not be allowed back in. And people who denied the faith only after they were tortured, uh, they should only be let, be let back in in certain circumstances. Okay? It was a hard question. And you can see, because they took this very seriously, that it's not easy. So, complicating a little bit was that those who had survived the persecution and the torture without lapsing, as I mentioned earlier, they were called the confessors, those, those who continued to confess faith in Christ, even under torture. The confessors were very highly regarded, and they were held by many to be more spiritual than ordinary Christians. And that it had been demonstrated because they maintained, even in the face of torture, belief in Christ. Some people believed that those confessors who were more spiritual, who God had given strength, they should be the ones to decide how do we deal with people who did become apostates. They were uniquely qualified to know what these people had gone through, so they should do it. <coughs> Excuse me. But many of these people were not leaders in the church. They weren't elders or bishops. They were lay people. And I'll find out where their work comes from. Um, <laughs> so this became a problem because the bishops particularly were saying the authority in the church, the authorities in the church have to decide this. There was a strong movement of people saying, no, the people whom God has shown to be his uniquely gifted servants, the confessors who have been tortured and still not apostate, they should be the ones to decide this. Well, Cyprian of Carthage, who, there's a lot of stuff about Cyprian, we can talk about him a lot. He was a bishop, he, had been, he was a young man when the persecution started, he had just been made bishop when the persecution started. Well, he fled. He fled because he said he felt the responsibility to continue to be leader for the church, and so he wrote letters constantly back to encourage his church. And he said, that's the way I can serve the church more, rather than be, you know, be taken off and tortured. And they didn't know at that time that they were going to actually kill a lot of people. They thought they were going to be martyred. Well, some people accused him of, accused him of cowardice. You know, why are you having an opinion about this when you ran away? Well, he wasn't a coward, and we know that because a few years later, he died a martyr when he could have run away. Okay, so Cyprian wasn't actually a coward, but he was accused of it. But he was one who insisted very strongly that it was the bishops and the other church leaders and not the confessors who had to decide on what to do with the lapsed people. That caused that difference between do the confessors decide or do the bishops and other church leaders decide caused schisms, splits in several places. There was a split in the church in Carthage where somebody else 
challenged Cyprian, and there was a split in Rome. The split in the church in Rome, and I don't mean by that the whole, you know, the whole church at this point. We're talking about the, the episcopate of Rome, the, just the Roman area. The split there, there were two splits. One, because a bishop, at that point I think it was Calixtus, he was allowing people back in after they had committed adultery and sexual sin fairly easily, and he had a guy, an elder, challenge him. And the elder got three other bishops to make him a bishop, so, and he, challenged, he said he was now the bishop of Rome. Well, that one died out pretty quick. But then there was a challenge made against two bishops later against the bishop of Rome by a man named uh, Novician, and it became the Novician Schism, where over this issue of apostasy, the bishop of Rome was one who was called a, a laxist, meaning he was lax in, a, in a, uh, evaluating these lapsed Christians, people who had been apostate, and he wanted to welcome them back in that the, they should consult with the bishop, and the bishop would make the decision, and if he felt like they really were repenting, he would lay hands on them, bless them, and bring them back to the church. Well, Novation was an elder, and he disagreed with this so strongly, he got other bishops to name him a bishop. He challenged the bishop of Rome, and that split, the Novation schism, lasted for generations over this issue of how do you deal with somebody who has denied the faith? Do you let them back in? If you do, are there circumstances for letting them back in? Who decides? Okay. Again, this issue affected the church for generations. This is where we get the doctrines of penance in the Catholic Church. Hopefully, you can, you know, and the, the, the idea in penance is you confess your sins to a minister, a priest, or a bishop. And that that priest or bishop then decides what must you do to, to satisfy the extent of your sin so that you then can be readmitted to full fellowship and do communion. Now for most of us, and I think it's not, it's not grossly inaccurate, the idea of somebody going in and saying, well, you know, I had carnal relations with three women this week, and they go, okay, do three Hail Marys and five whatevers, and uh, then you can take communion. You're going, what? I don't think so. And then the extreme version of that, of penance, where people flagellate themselves. Now, just outside San Miguel de Allende, there's a, there's a village which is widely known for being the center of a sect of flagellants. To flagellate means to whip. And they, they, as regular acts of penance, they will whip themselves. The people who will crawl on their knees for miles and miles and miles to the you know the shrine of the Virgen de Guadalupe, right? And you're going, why do they do that? It goes back to this: when someone has sinned in some degree, the question of do you just take them back in? Is it that easy? Okay, say say five Hail Marys and then your adulteries. Or be forgiven until next time. Or do they have to pay some more serious uh, price in order to really prove and to really demonstrate and to really be sure themselves even that they are serious about having asked for forgiveness and have repented and really do want to be part of the body of Christ again? Crawl on their knees or flagellate themselves? I'm not advocating that. I'm saying that historically, absolutely not. Historically, we need to understand that there are reasons why the church struggled with that then, and we never have really figured it out. If you have committed a serious, serious sin, an offense against God, you just say, oh well, sorry about that, Lord, I'm forgiven, good, let's go on. Really? Is it that easy? Yes? Is that why... Uh, the Catholic Church will not give communion to non-Catholics? Well, that's a different issue. I mean, the Catholic Church will not give communion to someone who has committed a, you know, a, a sin that they're aware of that they have not done penance for and be forgiven for. That's closer to it. Oh. The issue of not doing it for Catholics is because, that goes back to Cy Cyprian, by the way. One of the things Cyprian said, it is related to it, because one of the things Cyprian said, that gets into the issue of um, who can legitimately offer the sacraments. Cyprian was involved in that issue as well. It was Cyprian, I have mis 
in the past mistakenly attributed this to Origen, it was actually Cyprian. Cyprian who said, you cannot be part, uh, you cannot have God as your father unless you have the church as your mother. And what he meant by that in that context was, you can't have the church as your mother unless you have received legitimate sacraments of baptism and of communion. If the person who offered you those sacraments was not a legitimate representative of the Catholic Church, then you are not from the Catholic Church, and therefore you're not saved. So the issue of the qualifications of the person offering the sacrament, not the reception of it by the person, being the issue. Cyprian was one of the people on the side that you have to make sure the person offering it is the right person, that they're righteous, that they're legitimate, that they are part of the church. Well, that... The issue of the Catholic Church not offering sacraments goes back to that. And so it's all kind of interwoven. Uh, but, but you can understand how when you had people who were being tortured, you know, the Bishop of Egypt lost an eye to torture. He actually was one of the laxists. He was one of the ones who, and he was highly regarded because of having suffered that much, he was one of the ones that says the grace of Christ is there for everyone who repents. And the bishop you know, should, should hear their confession, should accept their repentance, and lay hands on them and bring them back into communion. And that carried a lot of weight. There were others like Cyprian and Novation and others who said absolutely not. And what they finally ended up with here, by the way, Cyprian won the day on this because he was considered a moderate. He said, if someone lied or cheated by buying a libellum illegitimately, but they didn't commit apostasy, they can confess that as a sin of lying, be, be blessed by the bishop and brought back to the church. No other consequences. If they underwent torture and then became an apostate, then again they can confess that as a sin. They can receive repent. You know they can repent. They can be blessed by a bishop and brought back into the church. But if they willingly offered sacrifice and they are not repentant about it, then they are damned. They can't come back to the church. If they willingly offered and are now repentant about it. They will be accepted back into the church on their deathbed. <laughs> so that they won't be damned forever, but they're not, they can't take communion. They are not part of the blessings of the church now. Um, the, um, so they were very serious about that. That was considered the moderate position, as opposed to those who said they can never come back and they are excommunicated and will never be part of the kingdom of God. Okay? So there were serious questions, and those questions have continued to play Christianity down through all of the years. All right? So you need to understand. Whether, no matter how you, you know, we're not Catholic, we don't, we don't have the, you know, penance. Penance is a, a sacrament in the Catholic Church. It's one of the seven sacraments. It is very serious, and it has been since then. So for 1,800 years, we don't have penance. Um, we have a very different view of that. But we need to understand, so often I hear people go, oh, that's so stupid. Why would they do dumb stuff like that? Well, there are historical reasons. It was a real problem that they were trying to find an answer for. Whether we like what the answer has interpret has been turned into in the 21st century or not is different. Okay, questions? About any of that? Um, there was one other thing I was going to talk about, which is the cult of the martyrs. We're not going to do that now because I've run out of time. I forgot I was going to, I had one other thing. We will pick up with the cult of the martyrs. The idea of where the saints come from. The idea of sainthood next time.